It is Season 2, Episode 8 of Everything Film from the Shark Club in downtown Vancouver. Joe Leary and Patrick Shelton. Of course, Everything Film presented by Agency Click. Our guest is, well, you talk about Triple Threat. This is like quintuple actor, director, dancer, singer, songwriter, producer. That's like six. Sydney Scotia is her name. Welcome to the program. How are you? Thanks for having me, guys. I'm doing great. How are you doing? Good. That's a lot of juggling. How do you, uh, how do you handle all those t- types of uh, talents? I mean, that, that's, that's, you've covered the gamut. You know, this is something I think about every day because it is a lot of things, and I love all of them, and I love every aspect of performing and being behind the camera. So right now, I'm just going where the wind blows me. If I get an opportunity in one direction, I take it, and I've just been saying yes to the opportunities that come my way, and then hope that it's the right decision, but it always ends up usually, everything happens for a reason, I like to believe. But it all sort of stems from one initial Mm -hmm. inclination or leaning. So what was that first thing that sort of branched off into so many others? Well, I started dancing when I was seven years old. I started as a competitive dancer and I grew up dancing six hours a day every day after school. Okay, hang on. What's competitive dancing when you're seven years old? What are you competing for? Okay, so here's what happens. When you're a competitive dancer at seven years old, you're going to class and learning new routines and new combinations and new recital pieces every day. And then on the weekends, you travel with all the parents and all the kids, usually a big group of girls. You go to a different city and you compete against people in different cities. And so you're at some hotel in Denver or Utah, because I grew up in Arizona, so we were usually just going to the neighboring states. And you're competing against a bunch of, bunch of other girls in your category. So that's competitive dancing. And you're, you're competing for bragging rights? Are there trophies? Are there cash prizes? Involved? There are scholarships, scholarships to the national competitions, which are at the end of the year, usually in a place like L.A. or New York. And so you're competing for those scholarships that y- so that you can go and compete for an even bigger title and then be the reigning champion for that year and be able to go to all the competitions as that reigning champ. It's quite an industry. Um, so w- when you like, what do you think of something like like Irish step dance, river dance, for example? I mean, is that is that a skill that you could like literally take to because of your ability to dance? It's such a different form of dance. I would love to do it. I've never done it, but that is very different from what I grew up doing. But I feel like if I were to go to an Irish step dancing class, I'd be able to at least pick up the moves and follow what they're doing. But that's something I've never done, but I do respect it. So I'm just curious about the uh, the whole uh, issue of dance because there's just so many incredible styles. And I just wonder, what, what is your range? What 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 can't you do and what can you do and what do you do well? No, I love talking about dance because nobody ever asks me this too. And it was such a big part of my life growing up. But I grew up doing ballet every day. It was kind of required at our studios that you had to do a ballet class as soon as you got to the studio. And then we would do contemporary, jazz, hip hop. I did a lot of ballroom, West Coast swing, um, some salsa. And then, you know, every variation in between, jazz, funk, tap dancing. I had a tap duet one year at the recital. But pretty much everything. They made sure that we were really well-rounded so we could go to these competitions and be competitive. I think, uh, I think TAP is seriously underrated. It is underrated. Or undervalued, maybe, is more the applicable term. But Both. It's, it's, such, right. it's such a great form of dance. It's such a great form of expression, but nobody seems to do it anymore. Uh, I know. Not it's, really. It, 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 yeah. it, is, it, is, it is an art form. Yeah, yeah. But I was going to say with um, swing dancing, that had a, it, had a, it, ca- it had a comeback there for a while, like 10 or years ago, but... What was it like during the war for you, Joe? When oh, you were swing exactly. Dancing? Yeah. Well, we would you know, we would dance for uh, it was it was a meager income, but we danced as much as we could back in the vaudeville stage and things like back that. Back in oh, okay, yeah. So Sydney, so you were primarily a dance person that just kind of branched out, and what was the reason behind that? I think at a young age, I always realized that dance wasn't a career that I wanted yeah. to pursue. It was my biggest passion and something that I loved, but it didn't seem like a career to me. All of my friends would go on to So You Think You Can Dance or do shows like that, but I didn't see the end goal there. So then there was an acting class at my dance studio, and so I started getting into that. My brother was a big inspiration for me because he took this acting class at my dance studio, and he was in the local theater. And I saw acting, and I thought... I used to watch a Disney Channel and shows like that and say, oh, that looks like that looks like a career. So back then, I kind of had the perspective just to know I want to take something in the performing arts all the way. So that's where that stemmed from. And then from there, 
I went to an acting camp. I had a choice one year between dance nationals. My mom gave me this choice, dance nationals or an acting camp in LA. And I chose the acting camp and then I went and then the rest is history. I just loved it. I think that, and also you direct, and mm-hmm. I'll give a comparison. Years ago, I used to do weather on city TV. Mm-hmm. And anytime someone would go, hey, I want to come down and, and watch you sometime, i go, no, no, you want to be in the control room. That's where the action is. I'm just standing in front of a green screen. That, there's no talent there at all. And did you find that it was better to sort of be on the other side of the camera because at least you get to control the action? This is something that I'm really passionate about right now. Directing is one of my main goals. It's at the forefront right now. And I love doing it because even from a young age, I saw people behind the camera and I would love sitting in the editing room on my first show. Sometimes during the live shows, we got to sit in that control room Mm -hmm. and watch them and go back and forth from, we were a four camera sitcom when I was on my first show and go back from a camera now switch to C camera. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And so I just tried to pick up skills wherever I could. And I really do feel like that is where the creative process happens is behind the camera a lot of the time and then they hire the actors that just fit the role and they come in do an amazing job and then leave but behind the camera is where the process is massaged it's funny because a lot of times people i I think again maybe undervalue the director of a production or the people that work on the production crew because they're the ones that are responsible for putting all the pieces together. Yeah, you can come in, lay down your lines. Okay, that's great, Sydney. Thanks a lot. Mm-hmm. But it's somebody else that has to do all that. When you're the person sort of in charge, it gives you a greater sense of purpose, I think. Like, that's not to dis- diminish the role of the actor at all. But I think that the people behind the scenes are of such value. I don't think that the general public really, truly... Like, they see the names on the screen, on the credits that they roll by. But they don't actually appreciate the roles that these people play. And I say from my own experience because... I know all I would do is I would literally stand in front of a green wall and point at clouds that weren't there. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> and everybody else did the magic and made it look like they go, great job. I did nothing. I just stood there and pointed. Yeah. Everybody else did the great job. Yeah, it's true. I mean, if you're a big director, these big directors in Hollywood, they get a good amount of credit. But I do find that when you're on a set of a, a smaller budget movie or TV show, yeah, maybe those directors aren't getting the credit that they deserve because they're there before everybody else. Mm-hmm. They're in their hotel room or in their house at night planning out each shot, and they're responsible for making everything look good and having such a clear vision and already having talked through that vision with the DP and with the producers so that everybody's on the same page. It really is like they're leading a ship. and. I mean, that's what I want to do. I love it. And I want to be there, you know, at 5 a.m. before really? everybody else. Really? Yes. Well, you I do. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know what I always think about when you hear this stuff? Is there is pressure on people because in, in the end, it is a business. And I think you get into that mystique where you don't realize that. They're there to make money. Like mm-hmm. Even every show mm-hmm. out there is there to make money through advertising. And there are people that have immense pressure on them to deliver so it, there's art people and then to deliver. And you never hear about movies that have bombed where somebody, you know, they dropped 20 million and it made like 500,000 at the box office because mm-hmm. those people usually don't work again or the producers, they have a hard time because of that type of pressure. Do you, get, do you know what I mean? And have you mm-hmm. ever been in those situations yourself where you felt there was pressure or the people above you were like panicking? Do you, do you, know, what I'm, you know where I'm going with that? Yeah, I mean, I have... I think on any set, there's an immense amount of pressure Mm -hmm. because you are trying to get so much done in such a short amount of time. And the time span just seems to get shorter and shorter on some films. And the lighting and the light that we're going to lose the light and people just go, just go ape. Like, ah. It is a high pressure environment. Usually the actors, they try not to let the actors see that. Yeah. Um, Especially my first show was a kid's show, and we never saw any of that, you know. Right, right. We very rarely saw any of the pressure, but we were putting a lot of pressure on ourselves to perform. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I do know what you mean. It's interesting, but sometimes... It's such a different... I guess what I'm getting at is such a different thing. You've got the the art of it and the love, and and then you've got the people that have to... So it's weird how they have to kind of meet. Yeah. It's like it's very... 
I, I always found that interesting, right? That At the end of the day, it's a money-making industry. You, um, yeah, yeah, it's kind of a... Sydney, you've, anyway. got, you've got so many titles. The one I don't see is voice actor. You must do some voice work. You know, I haven't done a lot of voice work. I did this one show called Reboot the Guardian Code that was yeah. half animated. Yeah, I was going to say. That's, you sound like you've got that type of voice that you could probably make some serious dollars in a studio. I oh, I would love to. Yeah. That's one attention, thing. Attention, attention, producers. Does anyone yeah. want to give me a voice acting yeah. job? Yeah. Um, no, but honestly, I love voice acting. And I trained in voice acting in L.A., and that helped me doing Reboot because it was half animated, half live action, and we had these animated characters, which was so fun. But that's something I would love to do as well. You, uh, w- We happen to know that as we record this show, um, you are on your way this evening mm-hmm. to a premiere in LA. Tell us what your uh, what what your day holds for you. Yes, I'm gonna hop on a plane. Your bag, right you're actually your, bag is, your bag is here. Your bag is back. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, I'm gonna hop over to YVR and go to LA for the premiere of Frank and Penelope, which is a movie I shot last year, and it's in theaters now in the states, and it'll, it'll go to streaming. And that was just a really really Baby. great experience. I'm Baby. so excited to see the cast again and the producers really, and everybody really at this premiere. So tell us about the movie. Okay, so Frank and Penelope is a story about two people who fall in love at the lowest point in their lives, and they run away together to escape all their troubles, only to find more serious and more dangerous troubles along the way. And my character, Molly, kind of has to face the same evils after they stop in this dangerous town to fight for survival for all of us. So it's a thriller, a suspenseful movie. It's a love movie. There's something for everybody there. So you're going to a big swing in Hollywood party tonight then after the premiere? Uh, you know, I have no idea what to expect, but I'm, there's the after party and we'll be there at the premiere. So this will be fun. It's, it's fun to celebrate once it actually comes out. So because you do so much, what would be the dream acting gig? What would be the dream directing gig? And what would be the dream singing gig? Wow. That's all three. All three. The trifecta. I know it's a loaded question. Let's take it one by one. Okay, acting. What would, you, what, what would you love to cut your teeth on? What would you love to just get your hands on? You saw something, you went, I could be in that. What would that be? Well, because dance was my first passion, I've always dreamt of doing a role where dance is incorporated in yeah. it. So doing... West Side Story, something like that? Something like that. A musical or... J- I grew up watching Center Stage and Step Up and movies like that. Big, flashy dance movies. I would love to do that. But I do, I do love having music incorporated as well. So the, I guess the dream would be able to direct my own content, my own films that have some sort of musical and dance aspect in it. So then kind of incorporating all of those. I'd love to be in a position of power and control to be able to make that content that I want to see. And what about the song? What about the singing? You know, music has been such a passion for me over the the past few years, writing my own music. And I want to do an EP. And I'm releasing a couple more singles this year. And I just released a couple in April and May. But I want to see my music in projects that I'm doing. Sure. So really combining all three is, is the goal, is the dream. Having my own projects with my own music, dancing, acting, and directing. Well, I go back to the. I, let's go back to the acting. So we've we've asked this question before. So, like, bad person, evil, or do you want to play somebody that is like tormented? You know, you, that's what yeah. he's kind of getting at. Like, mm-hmm. what 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 would you be drawn to? Like a a woman that's like tormented, or like, do you want to? Do you, do you get? Where the, yes, I know exactly what you mean. Like, what what what's your feel that you think you would nail it? You know, if you got the opportunity. Okay. Well, dream character would be. A role like Shirley's Theron in Atomic Blonde. Okay. Something very action-packed. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, very powerful, strong, kick-butt woman who can do some stunts. I would love to do something like that. Oh, that's a great answer. That's yeah. A great answer. And you'd be, of course, you'd be the good person, the good guy. No. Whatever, you know, yeah. I'm okay. You know, she's kind of a double agent there. You don't really know. At the okay, that's true. That's true. That's I, think, true. I think there's, I think there's more fun playing evil than there is playing the good person. I, I, I would think. It's yeah. Just, it's a meteor performance, I would think. It's true. It's true. Playing a villain is yeah. is fun. You know, growing up, I got to play a lot of the, the mean girl at school. 
and and that's always fun. But you weren't the mean girl at school. No, okay. no. <laughs> I like the rule. I like the rules. You know how you have a, the bad person that you like that's actually the good person. Like yeah. all the mob, all the mob movies are like that. Like Sopranos, they're doing terrible things, but you like them. The trick with a villain is it has to, they still have to. You have to you love still have to, to like them. them, right? Yeah. Like it's like the yeah. Tony Soprano was awful, but you know he was. Uh, Love by Tony was a good guy. Tony was a good guy. Great guy. Great guy. Just got a exactly. little misled. Exactly. Yeah. Get him with the wrong crowd, I think, is the term. Sydney Scotia is her name. How do we find you on uh, Twitter and Instagram? I'm at Sydney Scotia on both Twitter and Instagram. Pleasure yeah. to see you. And uh, have fun in L.A. Thank you. Thanks, guys, for having me. Cheers. Hey, thank you.